I like boogers. Yes, I do. I say, I like boogers. How about you? I like to eat my boogers about every day. I like to eat my boogers in different way. Sometimes I like them cold. Sometimes I like them hot. But most of the time, I like them with snot. Now, you may think that I'm being gross, but I even eat a booger on my toast. A booger for dinner, a booger for lunch, a booger anytime. Yes, so I you're probably wondering, boogers. what in the yes, I world? I love boogers. Stick around about you. and find out. I said booger, 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 booger. Uh, uh, uh. Booger, 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 booger. Welcome to the More Than Enough podcast, where we invite some of our friends to help you and some of your friends work together to provide more than enough, filling the biggest gaps for children and families before, during, and beyond foster care where you live. Here's your host, Jason Weber. Hey gang, welcome to the More Than Enough podcast. If you are still listening after uh, hearing the booger rap, you listen to that all the way through and you are still with us, then we can be friends. You are my kind of people. Um, we are excited to dive into a really important topic today. Uh, it's this idea of how we define success uh, as we engage with people who are hurting. Uh, and sometimes uh, we have in our minds uh, this this idyllic image of what success looks like and how fast we ought to be able to get there when we're working with people who are experiencing hard things. And we're going to examine that a little bit today. We're going to open that up and and look at it. And we have uh, a few really incredible guests who are going to help us to do that. Now, often the world's view of success is tied to quarterly progress reports and numbers and those kinds of things. But we're going to talk today about what it looks like to trust the Lord and focus on our primary job that He gave us in Scripture and that is to love people well. So let's get started with uh, a conversation that I had with a, an old friend of mine. He was actually my first boss um, decades ago when I first uh, got married to my wife, Trisha, and we moved into inner city Denver to do inner city ministry. And he was my boss there. And he's been doing ministry for over 40 years. And he is one of the best people I've ever seen at just meeting people where they're at and loving them well. And so I wanted to ask him about it. I wanted to talk to him about what it is that helps him to do that. So let's jump into that conversation with my friend, Salt Wall. Hello, Salt Wall. How are you, sir? Hey, hey Mr. Jason Weber. Good to, good to be here with you. Uh, I'm good. It's good to see you. Good to see you, too. Good to see you, too. Well, so the first thing, Salt, that people are going to want to know, because they're they're wondering right now, they're, they're, they're asking themselves the question, did, did he say Salt? Yeah, I picked up that nickname my first year of high school. Me and a guy named Lewis Kelly were always together. We were inseparable. And so our friends started calling us Salt and Pepper because we were always together. Lewis is black. I'm white. We didn't call each other Salt and Pepper. Matter of fact, I think we might have even been annoyed by it. <laughs> uh, but then fast forward uh, two years and my senior year of high school, and I start reading the Bible and I read about, uh, you know, Jesus's Sermon on the Mount telling us that we should be salt and light, salt of the earth and light of the world. And so at that point, I embraced the nickname Salt because I want to be uh, the salt of the earth type of person. Uh, so you grew up in the city. You grew up in uh, in urban Denver. Uh, what was it that uh, convinced you that you wanted to stay there and continue to, to love on people there? Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I definitely uh, experienced what it was like, in a sense, being uh, the underdog, just because of the way that I grew up and how and how I grew up. And so there were so many opportunities to then go influence and invest in people that are also uh, being looked upon like, oh, you're never going to, you know, make anything happen in your life. You're going to be one of those statistics. And what a blessing it's been to be able to learn from others and be able to pass on some things to maybe fellow underdogs, if you will. So, Salt, one of the main components to you being able to love people well 
was you being able to connect with people. And I watched you uh, over and over again connect with people in ways that just amazed me. You could walk into a high school and within 10 minutes, you'd have a whole crowd of high school students uh, crowded around you and, and you just connected with them so well. One of the tools, you had many of them, but one of the tools you used to connect with students uh, was something called the booger wrap. Could you share a little bit about that with us? <laughs> sure. You know, uh, these kids were rapping all the time, and, and so often they were just rapping about kind of nasty things. And I was like, there's no creativity to this. And and so they challenged me a little bit, and they said, well, let's see you do it. And I said, all right. I said, tell you what, just pick a word, any word you want, and I'll make up a rap about it. So they picked the word booger. And so then I said, okay, well, give me a beat. So they were like, and I said, I like boogers. Yes, I do. I say, I like boogers. How about you? I like to eat my boogers about every day. I like to eat my boogers in different way. Sometimes I like them cold. Sometimes I like them hot. But most of the time, I like them with snot. Now, you may think that I'm being gross, but I even eat a booger on my toast. A booger for dinner, a booger for lunch, a booger anytime. Yes, I love to munch on boogers. Yes, I do. I love boogers. How about you? I said booger, 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 booger. Uh, uh, uh. Booger, 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 booger. <laughs> I've I've probably heard that booger rap hundreds of times. It it doesn't get old. It it just doesn't. In addition to watching you uh, connect with students so well, you also taught us a ton about what growth actually means and what progress means when it comes to loving people. And you challenged some of our assumptions. And you used to tell this one story about spiritual growth and progress. Could you tell that? Sure. You know, there were a few guys uh, in that group, Jason, and I think the question I asked them was, how do you see God working in your life? And one kid in particular said, well, I know God's at work in my life. And I said, well, how do you know that? And he said, well, I haven't stolen a car for over a month. <laughs> and I was like, oh, that's great. God is at work in your life. Well, it was growth because he used to steal a car every weekend. That's how he got around on the weekend. So we just celebrated yeah. those things. So what what have you learned over the years? I mean, you've been in ministry now for, for 40 years. And what have you learned about loving people well, loving people from hard places, loving people who are hurting? Uh, what has God taught you about loving well? Well, we've been loved well. You know, I think Jesus is our model. I always think back to the woman that was caught in adultery and, and the religious leaders asking Jesus what they should do with her. And, and then eventually he tells them, you know, he who is without sin cast the first stone. And the woman is left there with no one there except her and Jesus. And that's just a picture of Jesus loving her well, not condoning what had happened, but just loving her well. And one of the best ways of doing that, I think, is just meeting them where they're at, hearing a little bit more of their story. That might give you a little more understanding of why they're acting or behaving the way that they do. I'm glad you brought that up because I, I think that's something that I, I learned from watching you as well, is sometimes when we pass people maybe that are homeless, the strong temptation is to to try to avoid eye contact because uh, you don't maybe you don't have anything you can give. But one of the things that I, I learned from you was, uh, regardless of whether you have something to give to somebody or not, you have an opportunity to to just help someone be seen, to love them, uh, and and even to this day, I'll I'll sometimes roll down my window at a at an exit ramp when somebody's flying a sign, and I'll say, "Hey, I don't have anything for you. I just want to see how you're doing out here. Are you you okay?" And uh, and I and I pick that up from from you watching you do that with folks all the time. Yeah, they, everybody has a story, right? And we don't have time at an exit ramp to hear all that story, but we can still be kind. We're representatives of, of God, right? So let's be kind. Let's be. Let's offer a smile. Let's ask a question like that, or or something else. Let's. Hey, you got a joke? What? Whatever. I don't know, but 
uh, we don't have to just avoid them. And, and you and I both, I, we remember we're being convicted by Isaiah 58 mm-hmm. that just tells us that we, we avoid our own flesh and blood. And so simple things can certainly add up. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And when you were talking a, a little bit ago about loving people and, and learning how to love them, uh, you know, one particular person came to mind, both in terms of what he taught, uh, I think, the both of us about uh, what it means to love somebody, but also what he taught us about being loved, that he was really good at, at loving others. And we got to see that. And that's uh, his name was Jimmy. And I was wondering if you'd be willing to share just a little bit about how we met Jimmy and what was going on in his life when we met him and what God did there. Sure. Well, we met Jimmy the summer of 97 and he was homeless. Uh, there were a group of college students that we were uh, just working alongside of that were in our city for that summer doing a, a project summer in the city. They met Jimmy. He had the guitar. Uh, they asked him to come and play for us, play for our group in a place that we called the Angels Den. And so he came and, and uh, you know, he played some Beatles and some other things. And it didn't matter to us what he was playing. We just invited him to come and break some bread. He used his gift of music and, and very talented guitar player. And then he had a meal with us. And initially, he really wanted to just like uh, destroy these kids, but they were so nice to him and so kind to him. He didn't want to. Uh, he, he didn't want to mess with their faith, and so he's like, "Well, I'll mess with their leader's faith." And then we were just as loving and kind uh, to him, and so we were too nice to him for him to mess with us. Anyway, we developed a relationship over time. Ended up having a very long-term relationship uh, with Jimmy, who just passed about 20 months ago. But Jason, here's the thing that really sticks out to me is is that, you know, Jimmy was an ex-heroin addict. Uh, He was on and off that a couple of different times. When we met him, his main drug of choice was alcohol, and it was really impacting his life. And it had a lot to do with why he was homeless. And eventually, um, he overcame uh, that addiction. But one of the times that I went to pick him up and just asked him to uh, come join me at a, I was speaking at, to some college students. Because at this point, and let me just back yeah. up. I, I just want to provide some context because uh, when we met him, and you said that he was trying to, you was thinking about trying to destroy the students and then destroy the leaders. It's because he he was an, a devout atheist, and he took a lot of pride in trying to dismantle uh, mm-hmm. arguments with 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 people who were Christians. And and through that process of those students loving him for uh, a couple of months, he he came to Christ. And so and so that is why he was going to go with you to to talk to others about God's love at this point. Yeah, by this time, he had embraced the faith, hadn't he? He had embraced the faith. And by the way, he would be the one to tell you that the only reason that he embraced the faith was that he he experienced God's love for himself. He experienced these college students loving on him unconditionally. He experienced us loving on him unconditionally, caring for him in practical ways, showing and demonstrating God's love in practical ways. And he just was like, that's the God that he fell in love with and started to serve himself. And then this was one of the ways that he eventually was serving God, was using his gift of music to then go share with others what it was like living on the streets and things that he's learned about God and what was the name of that? How, how deep? How deep and how wide? Yep. How deep and how wide God's love is, and that was what he was going to testify about uh, that evening. He, I knocked on his door, and I could, I could hear him anyway. Long story short, Jimmy was drunk, like totally drunk, and 
but he was supposed to go talk to these college students over at Colorado School of Mines. And anyway, he says, come in. I come in. I see what kind of condition he's in. And I looked at him. I said, so are, are you still going? And he looked at me like, what? You still want me to go? And I'm like, well, can you do it? And he said, I think so. I said, well, let's go get some coffee in you. Let's try to sober you up a little bit. We got about an hour. He threw some jeans on, a T-shirt on. We stopped at a store, got some coffee. So he's smoking. He's drinking some coffee. We get to uh, the uh, the school. You know, I introduced Jimmy. And we're just being up front with the students and like, Look, this is we're here to talk about. We were actually there to talk about God's love. And later on, Jimmy, he told me after the fact, because he was beating himself up for disappointing me, disappointing these kids, uh, telling himself the lies that he's so useless and worthless and all these other things. And he said, but when you said, come on, let's go. He's like, it's like you just snatched me right out of the lion's jaws of his mouth. And that's exactly what he needed was just, again, some more unconditional love being uh, passed on his way. Hmm. Yeah. And, the uh, you know, Jimmy was so good at, at, at loving others as well. Um, and I, I learned so much from watching him. And when he came to Christ, he, he just immediately uh, fell into uh, loving others, showing up at, at the bus stop uh, every week early in the morning to hand out socks to others who are homeless. And he just never, uh, never stopped loving people. He never stopped. It was good. And, and when he got to the point, Jason, where his body wouldn't allow him to get up and go to the bus stop uh, ministry anymore. And towards the end of his life, he was just mostly just laying in bed. And one day he was just lamenting and he was sad. And he's like, I feel so useless. I can't get up. I, I'm not able to go and share my story. I'm not able to hardly sing. He you know, had like emphysema. And he said, all I can do is sit around here and pray all day. And I was like, Jimmy, what a ministry prayer is. Mm-hmm. And he loved, think about how he loved he loved my kids so much, and he was so faithful to pray for uh, for my sons. He was he was probably the more faithful than anybody I knew praying for our boys. Yeah, yeah. You saying that? You know, Jimmy was he he showed up. We invited him, and he showed up at our adoption day party for our twins when they were three and a half. And he showed up with his guitar, and he was the musical entertainment for that party. And uh, he was playing, you know, the Lord said to Noah, we're going to build an arky arky. And uh, he, he, uh, he just, he, he did. He loved on our kids so well. Salt, thank you for uh, remembering with me and talking with me uh, about what it looks like to, to love people uh, who are hurting. Yeah, thank you, Jason. I tell you, sometimes people say, well, what do you want on your tombstone? And I think if all of us could say, if we just said, you know what, we loved God and we loved others well, uh, then what a testimony that is of a life well lived. And, And just a reminder that, you know, we don't do this in our own strength. It is so supernatural to love unconditionally. You know, uh, God's the one that empowers us to love the way that he loves. And that is indeed unconditionally. Amen. Amen. Well said, Saul. Thank you. Amen. Mm -hmm. That is an incredible man right there. Thank you, Saul. Here in a minute, we are going to hear from uh, an amazing woman who grew up in a home where her parents uh, were foster parents. And she learned a lot through that experience about what it means to love and not fix. So we're going to hear from her right after this. Hey, gang, we're going to get back to things here in just a minute. But before we do, I wanted you to know that you can find the show notes for this episode by going to morethanenoughpodcast.org. 
There's some more information about our guests there, and we have some resources that can help you take your next steps to bring people together in your community to provide more than enough for children and families. And one last thing, at the top of the show notes, there are some buttons that allow you to choose where you normally listen to your podcasts, and you can leave a review for the More Than Enough podcast right there. We would be super grateful if you'd be willing to take the time to do that. Reviews help us to know what we're getting right and how we can give you more of the same in the future. Again, all of this is at morethanenoughpodcast.org. All right, let's get back to things. Welcome back. You're going to hear from our next guest uh, through a message she gave several years ago at an event we hosted. Uh, her name is Chelsea Geyer, and she co-founded and then served as the executive director of DC 127 for seven years. She has continued her career in Washington, DC in social innovation and ensuring that people have access to the services they need to thrive. Chelsea learned about foster care and adoption at an early age when her parents began fostering and three siblings joined her family permanently. In this message today, she faces the question of what does success look like in foster care head on, and she draws from both her work and her family. The title of this message is Love Don't Fix. When I was nine, my parents sat my sister and I down for a family meeting. Now, my parents really loved family meetings. I was expecting to be told that I didn't load the dishwasher correctly or I needed to pick up more dog poop. I was ready. I was ready for two weeks of a really strict chore chart, and then it would die out like all of the other family meetings did. That's not what I got. You're going to get two brothers, my parents said. And the kicker was they weren't coming in nine months. They were coming in just a few weeks. You see, that's how it happens when you adopt from foster care. It just happens. And in fact, we got a few weeks more warning than most do. And so my brothers came. They became part of our family. We went from a family of four to a family of six, later settling as a family of seven. Two years later, my parents held another family meeting. It was just me and my, youngest, my, my sister and my youngest brother. The oldest brother was oh, um, coming home late for an appointment. But then my parents told me that my brother wouldn't be coming home. They told me that they had made the difficult decision that they couldn't provide the love and support that my brother needed to thrive. My parents told me that my brother was being removed from our home. And this hit. It was hard. At 11, I didn't completely understand what was going on. And I get it now, but I can only imagine what my parents felt at that time. What does it feel like to tell a child who has hopped from home to home that you wanted to provide him with the love and support of a family, but you just couldn't? And I bet if I pulled the room, that other feelings of this sort of failure would be, would be here. I've experienced these now in my own life growing up, and maybe you can relate to this. Times when you love somebody who's in a tough spot or a tough situation, and you love them, and you invest in them, and you hope for this change, and the change just doesn't happen. And it feels like failure. And before I go on, I don't want to discount those feelings because they're real, and they don't just float away into space. I've had good friends listen to me weep over my feelings of failure, and I hope that if you can relate to what I'm saying, you have those folks in your life as well but we have to understand where they come from because we can't live in those. And so here's my question. What does it mean to fail in foster care? What does failure really look like? So defining failure means we have to define success. And this isn't Webster's dictionary definition. This is my definition. But I see success as a positive change from when something started to when it ended. And I feel like that's fair, right? I feel like that's an okay definition. Businesses celebrate profit at the end of a quarter. Businesses don't celebrate going into more debt than what they invested. Even in other works of justice, we celebrate change. We celebrate making reform. We celebrate goals, right? But the problem is when we bring that transactional, linear mindset to the realm of real relationships with real human beings. That linear mindset of end goals and end relationships means that our love then is is centered around us, and it's centered around our ability to provide change. It lacks the solidarity and selflessness that real relationships require. Selfless love means saying that your love will exist no matter what happens. Your love will be right here. And in foster care, that is hard. Sometimes in foster care, that means waking up every day to the same difficult behaviors and loving through those behaviors. Sometimes in foster care, that means walking right next to somebody through heartbreak after heartbreak after heartbreak. 
And sometimes in foster care, that love, that real honest love, means saying that you can't provide the home or the parenting or the mentorship or the relationship someone needs to thrive. But when Christ calls us to love, he didn't say fix because you were first fixed. I bet if I also pulled the room that no hands would pop up about who feels like they've really been fixed. We're told to love because you were first loved. And no matter your role in foster care, whether as a parent, a mentor, a friend, a babysitter, a Sunday school teacher, a church advocate, we are called to love selflessly. We are called to open our homes, our lives, our time schedules, and open up our safety and comfort to the children who need it across our country. And we still celebrate change, but we also have to celebrate that unseen background selfless love. My brother may have left our home, but he didn't leave our family. Even without signed adoption papers, my brother is still an active part of our family at every wedding, at every celebration. He was the one to dump ice water on me for the ALS challenge. And I recognize that not every story of foster care removal ends like this. But friends, the kids that we served were not failed when we showed up and the things that we wanted to happen didn't. The kids that we served were failed by a much bigger broken system and a sinful world. We only fail when we don't show up. We fail when we don't obey our call to care for and love these kids in whatever capacity because they are our kids, they are the kids of our city and we are called to them. Friends, failure in foster care is not when we fail to fix, but when we fail to show up and love. Mm. Failure in foster care is not when we fail to fix, but when we fail to show up and love. I can't think of a better way to say that. So, so good. Well, earlier you heard Salt mention our friend Jimmy and just how impactful it was to hear him share his testimony through song. Stick around and you'll get to hear Jimmy share that song right after this break. Hey, this is Jason Weber. And I am Diego Fuller. I was a foster parent for 10 years and have been a foster care advocate for nearly 20. And I grew up in the foster care system and now I minister to young people all across the country by sharing my music and telling my story. You know, foster parents and foster care advocates like me could do better if we knew better. And we'd know better if we listened to the people who know best. That's those who've experienced foster care firsthand when they were kids. And that's why we created a limited series podcast to introduce you to amazing men and women who spent time in foster care. That's right. The Foster Movement Podcast will not only help you to get to know 18 of the most inspirational people you'll ever meet, you'll gain wisdom and insight that you just cannot get any other way. And let me tell you, it's going to challenge you, it's going to inspire you, and I promise you, it's going to make you better. So subscribe now to the Foster Movement Podcast, part of the More Than Enough family of podcasts. They'll help you work with others to provide for children and families before, during, and beyond foster care until there's more than enough. At the beginning of this episode, Salt Wall talked about our mutual friend, Jimmy Rienzo, and just how Jimmy's understanding of God's love for him inspired so many of us. And so many of us can relate to the words of a song he often sang. And the song is based in Ephesians 3, 17 through 19, which says, And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Here's my late friend, Jimmy Rienzo. secrets of my heart there is no hiding in the dark from you oh and lord you know my heart at both extremes yet after all that you have seen you could still love me lord you love me How wide, how deep Your 
love must be You love someone like me How long, how high You carry me Lord, how deep Your love must be Look inside of me Sometimes causes me to weep And do you cry too? Oh, and I I don't know how you choose to stay So many times I've walked away From you From you How wide your love must be to love someone like me. How long, how high you carry me, Lord, how deep your love must be. So sharp. Even the darkest night can't hide. Lord, I won't hide your love from me. How wide, how deep your love must be to love someone, someone like me. Well, thank you for joining us today. I want to thank each of our guests, even the ones who like boogers. And I want to thank our producer, Amanda Baird, and our sound engineer, Daniel Davidson. Thank you for everything you are doing to love children and families before, during, and beyond foster care. We're here to help you do that until there's more than enough. This has been the More Than Enough podcast. Join us next time as we introduce you to more of our friends who are passionate about helping you and your friends work together to provide more than enough for children and families before, during, and beyond foster care where you live. Explore show notes and learn more at morethanenoughpodcast.org.